Okay, so go ahead and work that problem. I chose this problem because it's exactly what you did in the lab yesterday. Okay. Um, so this is just mass of rock minus mass of this. So... So this is our mass of water displaced. Okay, so then our rock volume would be mass over the density of water. So it would just be this. The same thing we just got. Is it in kilogram? People who get it from this equation, I'm not trying to put it. The normal density equation, they would just. You're going to do this one? You're going to do this one? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> so that's the volume you get. Okay. Well, first we use the formula for density, and then we, we just make it so it's equals volume. Just because That's you the me for a moment, okay. those are subscript R's and what are the actual cases, I think. 0. 0.223 over a thousand. Two two three kilogram. Four thousand. And that's what you get. Oh, okay. And um, what a thousand? Yeah. I just. I don't remember the units. said those are ours I think it should be the mass of the water and the density of the water so it's just times quantity because density is one what what do you mean about that she's saying the mass of What are the units on your uh, volume there? Did I only get one time? Millimeters? Millimeters? Oh, two bits on your Yeah. <laughs> and this was a meter cube. That was meters. Oh, that was meters. Meter cube. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Now we can write it to centimeters. All right, cool. Okay, is that it? It's not in meters, you have to convert it to some meters. Hmm? That's in meters cubed. Oh, this? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> That's not in meters cubed. Where's the eraser? Here, just a bag. Do you know where the eraser is on here? Just a bag of this. Yeah. So that's a good idea.
What is that? No. A thousand. So to convert, <clears throat> can I see your work? To make the conversion easier, I think it's you want to have centimeters on top and meters on bottom. So just multiply it by the number of centimeters per meter, and then because it's meters cubed, you have to cube the entire um, conversion factor. So just be at one point zero kg. And we can just wait to the near of two months. Mm -hmm. Instead of to the near of one, we two. All here? I think so. I just left mine in kilograms or in meters cubed because that's for the next one it needs to be in meters cubed. Mm -hmm. So it's negative, um, negative two, you said, up here? Is that what you said? Okay. Hmm? There's no three. Oh. That was right before. It was still nice for meters cubed. <laughs> Do the next part. Do the next one. <coughs> okay, the next one's over here. It's a little really different. Density. So that's the volume. You can see the importance of working with units. Centimeters cubed. I don't know to keep my units. Well, you need to put that. Are your units grams per centimeter cubed? Yeah, the grams get so long. Grams per centimeter. And then right to one hundred and three, two hundred and twenty three. Right to what? And then that's for B2. Is that, is that MU? Mm -hmm. That's B2. Is that a D? That's just displacement, so I don't think that's necessary for units. Okay. B is 2. found all of their numbers. I'll go over the units here just because the units are an important thing that you can see the potential confusion. Thank you. So this here was the density in units of kilograms per meter cube, which gave the answer in meters cubed, which he had written and then erases there trying to figure out how to do the units. 
to convert the units, you just have 100 centimeters per meter. And because that's meters cubed, I need to cube this conversion factor. So 100 cubed is 10 to the sixth. 10 to the six times 10 to the minus four, you just add those exponents to get 10 to the two. So that comes out to be 223 centimeters cubed. So this number is correct if you put the cube there, but it says in cubic centimeters. So you need to put for your answer the number in cubic centimeters. And that's the only other thing is this was centimeters cubed there to get units of grams per centimeter cubed. Now I want to do another problem here. It's actually one that I at least alluded to in lecture earlier, but I'm gonna see if it's finally loaded. Nope. Then I'm gonna go back to the homework page and copy to another problem. This one here. Oh, come on, seriously? There we go. I know I copied a little bit more than one because it's relevant. Okay, this problem here says the figure shows the effect of the tube radius on the height <clears throat> to which capillary action can raise a fluid. In this problem, assume the contact angle for water in the glass is zero degrees. The first important thing is, what does it mean to say the contact angle is zero degrees? That's actually the reason I'm doing this problem because the next one, problem five, asks you what is the contact angle. So if we don't know how to identify the contact angle, we're going to be lost when we get there. So the contact angle, if I look at my tube and the water in it, the contact angle is the angle, zoom way in, it's the angle right there where the contact is. So that's going to be my angle theta. And in this problem, it tells us the contact angle is zero degrees. So that means that in this problem, problem four, the water is vertical on the edges and then is curving as you come in. Why is that important? Because the force of surface tension is always parallel to the surface of the fluid <coughs> leaving the material. So since that fluid is vertical, that means that our surface tension force is going to be fully vertical. In this problem down here, we're going to calculate a contact angle that's not zero and we're going to use the vertical portion. So if we have a force, well, force of surface tension is going to be up in that direction, pulling up on the water. If the force of surface tension is like that and I want the vertical portion, then the vertical portion, if I draw it like this, the vertical portion is the adjacent side and the force vertical is equal to the force surface tension times cosine of that contact angle. I want to make sure it's really clear what the contact angle is and how it relates to the problem. So the, the vertical force due to surface tension will be force surface tension times cosine of that contact angle. Now coming back to this problem, this one's vertical so it's going to be easy. If I take the water that is in this column, I have some height h, some diameter d, because I think it's asked for, it gives diameters, yeah. And I am asked about the forces. 
when I look at this, what forces would be acting on the water in my tube? So I'm treating this water as a block. What forces would be acting on it? Okay, force of gravity. So I'm going to have force of gravity equals mg. What else? Okay, somebody said normal. Normal is, of course, a correct answer because this water is touching things. It's touching, for instance, the sides of my walls, which puts a horizontal force. I'm only going to look at vertical forces, so I'm not going to consider that force because it's horizontal. So it exists, but it's not what I'm going to consider because we know it's going to add to zero horizontally. Okay, force of surface, the force of surface tension is pulling up on the sides. And so the force of surface tension is equal to the surface tension, which they gave us the number for the surface tension right there, multiplied by the contact length. Well, this is a circular tube, so how do I find the contact length for a circle? 2 pi times the radius. Now, there is another pair of forces that add up to zero. Because on the top of the water, I have atmospheric pressure making a downward force. But at the bottom of the water, I have atmospheric pressure at that level making an upward force. And so since it's atmospheric pressure pushing on the bottom and the top, the bottom being where the blue line is, I'm going to have pressure atmosphere at the surface of the water there. It's the same pressure pushing down and pushing up, hence the net from those two, force pressure down and force pressure up, those two add to zero. They exist, they're real numbers, but they add to zero. And so in my brain, I'm just not gonna write those numbers out. It's an equilibrium, so sum of the forces equals mass times acceleration equals zero doing it all in the y direction. So that's going to be force pressure up minus force pressure down, which add up to zero, plus force surface tension minus force gravity equals zero, which gives me force surface tension equals force of gravity. Now I just put in my values, except it's not as simple as it sounds. My force surface tension is going to be gamma 2 pi r. My force of gravity is mg, but I need to convert that m into something that has to do with the height of my column. Because otherwise I don't have anything to tell me about the height of my column. And so how can I relate the mass to the height of the column? That's true, and it, it's, it's insane. We know that mass can be written, as was done by the students just before this, as blank times blank. Mass is density times volume. So I'm going to use mass is equal to density times volume, and the volume is equal to pi r squared times the height. So mass is equal to pi r squared height. Oh, times rho. Don't forget the rho. And so there's an equation that relates the forces. It doesn't look like a force equation anymore. It looks really complicated. And then we just need to solve this for height. So height is equal to gamma 2 pi r over pi r squared rho g. The pi's cancel. 
one of the R's cancels. And so there's my equation for the height. Then I just need to, don't make a mistake at the very end. They gave us the diameter. So remember to divide that diameter by two to get the radius when you put it in there. And part, uh, part B is just reversing things, solving it for radius. Does it say radius? Yeah, part B is solving it for radius as a function of height. So it's the same work. So I've got down to as far as it will be the same for everybody. In the next problem, the thing that's going to be different in the next problem is that your force from the surface tension in the vertical direction is not going to be all of it. It's going to be times cosine theta. Yes. Um, I know in the book, it gave us like that equation, like the last simplified version of it. Does this mean that like for the test, we'll have to derive it? Um, yeah, you should be able to, to find the equation using Newton's second law. Okay. Yeah, because, yes. So then if we don't show Newton's second law, we lose points? Um, if it was one of the synthesis questions, yes. All righty. Let's get to, <laughs> I already am way behind in my lecture schedule. We're going to talk about fluid flow now. We've been talking about static fluid so far. Today, we're shifting into fluids that are flowing. And so I've got some pictures here from NASCAR. I, I have to admit, as a child, I loved car racing, and I still enjoy watching from time to time. Yes. Going to the dirt track, i got to say, it's a lot of fun. One of the things that is very clear if you watch NASCAR racing is the effects of aerodynamics. Now, there is huge amounts of physics that go into designing their cars. And one of them is making sure that you're going to have downforce. You want something that's going to push the wheels down. Why? Because the force of friction is proportional to the normal force. If you push the wheels down harder, you're going to have more force of friction, which means you're going to have better traction for steering as well as for accelerating and braking. So one of the things they want to do is have some downforce. So they have a little spoiler here that's going to help push the back of the car down, giving them more downforce. They also are going to have the undercarriage shaped so that they can use the air to create more downforce. And there are at least your stories, if you measure the downforce, at racing speed, the cars could drive upside down because they're producing so much downforce. Also, two cars are better than one. When you have cars racing, they like to team up. And NASCAR has done a lot of fiddling with things to make this so sometimes it works not as good. Because when you have two cars together on a big track, they can go much faster than one car by itself. And so the cars will team up in twos and go zipping along. Why can they go faster in a pair than with one? Because each car naturally is going to have a high pressure region in front because it's coming and hitting the air. It's going to have a low pressure region in back where you actually have turbulence. The air is going like this behind it because you've been displacing air. Now it's filling in a gap. And so if you think about forces, forces, pressure times area, you have a force in front that's a higher pressure times area, a force below that's a lower pressure times area. That means you have a net force pushing you backward due to the air. But if you take two cars and you team them up, the pressure difference between them pretty much disappears. And you basically have the same net force on the two cars from air that you had on just one car. But you have twice the power being generated because you have two engines going here. And so the force backward per engine is half as much. Hence, you have more forward energy you can produce compared to the backward you can go faster to get the drag to balance. So two cars together can naturally go much faster than one car. And so things NAS NASCAR has done is made it so you just can't get as much of an advantage from that 
And there are things you might have noticed in racing if you watch, like somebody comes up here and gets close and then this guy spins out. This guy spins out because when that guy gets close, the downforce caused by the spoiler kind of gets defeated by him coming up. And so he loses downforce, the back end rises, doesn't have as much friction, and he goes off the track. And of course, NASCAR racers are good enough that they can, if need be, intentionally dump another driver to get him out of the way so they can win a race. And you do see that happening. You know, get, get up close just when he's needing it the most and he spins out and away you go. So we're going to be looking at not NASCAR racing. That's the last we'll talk about cars, but about these effects. So in order to talk about one of the first things we have to talk about is what we call just a continuity equation. If I have a liquid and the liquid isn't filled with bubbles or gaps or the vacuum regions, if it's nice, continuous flowing fluid, then if I have a confined space, the amount of fluid flowing per second anywhere in that tube needs to be the same. Otherwise, we'd be storing fluid or producing fluid. So we call that continuity, the fluid in equals the fluid out. So there's a couple different ways we talk about that. Way number one is just looking at the volume. So the volume in would be the area multiplied by a distance. So I could say, hmm, the distance would be the speed multiplied by some time. So the volume in is equal to area in times speed in multiplied by some delta t. And the volume out would be the area out times the speed out times delta t. And the flow rate, notice I have the term here, flow rate. Flow rate is just defined as Q is equal to V over delta T. So if I take my Q in equals Q out, then my V in over delta T equals A in V in is equal to V out over delta T equals A out V out. So what that gives us is an, an important relation that says, notice if these are equal, the area in times the speed in is equal to the area out times the speed out. So we call that our continuity relation. Now there is a mass version as well that would allow for the density to be changing. And so you just have density on both sides to get the mass continuity equation. But for us, this is good enough. Just the volume continuity equation, the volumetric flow rate in is equal to volumetric flow rate out. So the area in times speed in equals area out times speed out. What's the important outcome of this? We have blood vessels in our bodies. When we get stressed, well, let's talk about when we get stressed, what happens? What do they do? Actually, the opposite. That's what happens when we relax. When we stress, they constrict. And that constriction, what's that going to do to the rate that blood flows through? It's going to speed it up. That's an important outcome on this. This is something where specifically my EMT teacher said it wrong and then he says isn't that right Richard everybody you should know he's a physics teacher and I'm like yeah it's not right <laughs> okay so as you make the area smaller the speed is going to increase that's the net outcome what he was talking about was pressure by the way that's getting on to what we're going to talk here with Bernoulli's relation what happens to pressure when that occurs what would you tend to think happens to pressure? What's the relationship between the pressure here and the pressure here? What would you tend to think? Okay. Yeah, P2 would have a higher pressure. Now, that is 
what my EMT teacher was trying to tell the students. And I had to say, no, that's not the way it works. Um, it, it actually lowers it. And so let's talk about that. So I actually put a link here to a YouTube video. Um, we all, well, okay. It's not going to work to click the link anyway. It's not that impressive because after, okay, now it's going to come up and we're going to watch it. The lady, mind you, is holding her baby. She has her baby. Oh, please, no sound. Come on. She's holding her baby in her arms. Her baby was not damaged in this. Now, it's it's not perfect because it's not 100%. Oh, come on. It's not 100% clear to me that she didn't bump the cart to make it get started. And if she bumps the cart and that's a slope thing, then it's not the, the effect I want to illustrate. The... This, the people who posted this said it's it's definitely the air pressure. That can happen due to the air pressure, whether she bumped it or not, whether it's sloped or not. The key here, okay, now I just got to stop the video, which, of course, takes an act of God with the way everything works for me. Get back to the lecture. The Bernoulli equation, which is derived from conservation, well, the work energy relation, conservation of energy. The Bernoulli relation, why is that zoomed in? Says that when, when wind is passing faster, it lowers the pressure. When a fluid is traveling faster, it lowers the pressure. So if the train is coming by really quickly, the Wind right next to the train is going fast, and that's going to be, or the air right next to it is going fast, and that's going to be a lower pressure than the air at the other side. So if you're standing close to that train, you have a low pressure on the side facing the train, and a high pressure on the other side, which means that the air has a net force in you that's pushing you into the train. Now, real physics relevance here. Laughable physics relevance. When I was finishing up writing my PhD, I was working at Battelle Pacific Northwest Laboratories in Richland, Washington. And the government required us to have a safety lecture every month. And the government did not say what the safety lecture has to be about. So I was not there when we had the water skiing safety lecture. They had a water ski safety lecture one day in, in the lab for the scientists to make sure they didn't have apparently a water ski injury in the lab. But I was there for the train safety lecture. You know, the principal investigators did not take these government regulations seriously. They just rotated you out to get it. Somebody called the railroad company, can you come and give a safety lecture? Person came in all hyped, you know, these people really want to know about safety. Everybody there knew Bernoulli's principal. And the only joy we had was watching all the videos she had of people standing way too close to the tracks and then the train coming and them going, boop, and back out the train. Yeah. Felt really bad for her because, you know, she came in really hyped about doing this in a very important lab and then basically came up. But it's a real thing. That's why they have lines that say, stand behind you. It's not so much that they're worried that you're going to be not paying attention and just get too close and get hit. It's that they're worried you're going to be standing there not paying attention. You're going to get pushed into the train. So this here is showing an example of, you know, when a car is passing a truck, the air going between them lowers the pressure and there's a force to push them close together. So I want to do my demonstration before I do the derivation. Demonstration number one, today is hair dryer day. So I'm going to blow the hairdryer over this paper. If what I've been saying is true, what should happen? Okay, it should lift. If I've been lying, 
Yeah. Uh, Yay! You can see it's a very very significant effect. So, so we can see Bernoulli had something here. The pressure on top was lower. Here is the derivation in real quick. We're going to take this container, this tube, and you have pressure on one side, pressure on the other side, and it's going to move. So you're going to have the work net is going to be the force on the left side, pressure one times area one, times the distance it moves, I'll call that x1, minus, why minus? Because on the other side, the pressure is this direction, the force is, and the motion is that direction. So the Make sure I have a direction for you. The pressure is this direction, the motion is that direction, so they're opposite directions. That's why it's negative. Minus pressure 2, area 2, that's the force on the other side, times x2. So that's my net work. Now using my continuity relation, a2 times x2, the area times the distance, is equal to a1x1. That is, just go back to what we did here. If we have a fixed amount of time, then Vn times delta T is X. V out times delta T is X2. So I have as a starting point A1X1 equals A2X2. That is volume in equals volume out. <laughs> so this is equal to... Pressure 1, A1, X1, minus pressure 2, A1, X1, or A1, X1 times pressure 1 minus pressure 2. So that's the net work done. What should net work equal according to the work energy relation? Net work equals change in. Kinetic energy plus change in potential energy. So I have to have the change in kinetic energy, which is going to be one half mass one V one squared minus or V the final is, is two, excuse me. One half M two V two squared minus one half M one V one squared. But because of this relation, we can say M one equals m2 is equal to rho a1 x1 right rho times volume does he times volume and so this is going to be one half density a1 x1 times v2 squared minus v1 squared and then the last part was changing kinetic and potential energy we have mass Again, rho A1, X1 is mass 1 or mass 2. Rises at height H. So change in potential energy is equal to rho A1, X1 times height 2 minus height 1. So now I put all of that together into the work energy relation. And since I'm writing all over the place, I'm just going to change colors and write it in the middle. which gives me Notice every term has an A1X1 in it. And so I can cancel those A1X1s because it's in every term. And then what we traditionally do is we move all the subscript 1s to one side of the equation, all the subscript 2s to the other side of the equation. So this equation becomes in the end P1. So I leave the P1 on the left side. Move the V1 across. It was a minus, so it's going to become a plus when I move it across. Can't forget the 1 half row. Same thing with the H1, have to add it across. 
I forgot to write the G here. Right, force of gravity. Did I forget it the other place as well? Yes, I forgot it here as well. Force of gravity is mg, not just m. So rho g h1 equals pressure 2 plus 1 half rho v2 squared plus rho g h2. And that equation is Bernoulli's equation. This equation relates pressure, elevation, and speed. If I have a continuous fluid, the pressure plus one half density times the speed squared plus density times g times the height is going to be the same for any location in the fluid. So this equation, you might have seen the equation Torricelli's relation. I'm not even going to use Torricelli's relation. It's just a special case of this for having the same elevation or the same elevation. I don't know. It's, it's just a special case of this. So I don't even use that. So first a question, what did I use to derive Bernoulli's relation? The work energy relation. It's not some magic, woo, where did that come from? It's something that you already understood. <laughs> Here's some practical examples, things you might have seen. This here, I always wondered myself. Here I am a physics teacher. I look at my water heater, I'm all, why is there a gap under the chimney there? That's just going to allow smoke to come out into the house, right? Well, the smoke coming out, well, the exhaust coming out of my water heater is going to be very hot air. Hot air is less dense than cold air, and it's going to rise. So it just rises right up out of the chimney. But as it's rising, what's happening to the pressure in that hot air compared to atmospheric pressure? Because it's moving, the pressure is... Stay loud enough for me to hear. Make sure it's lower. So because the pressure is lower, it's going to pull in cool air from outside, and that helps to cool the chimney because it's drawing in some cool air with that hot rising air. So that's why you have that vent in the chimney. So in this picture, you can see the actual vent here. It's not nearly as clear because we don't yeah. contrast not so good here. But you can see there's a vent there. With the Bunsen burner, I always get annoyed. It's open to the air down here, right? Air can go in right there. What's, that's going to cause a problem, right? Arm, am I not going to have a flame coming out there? And of course, if I were to plug the top, I would. But the point of this is you have the gas that comes in here and flows up, lower pressure because of the flowing gas, it pulls in some air. The air is important because your fuel needs not only heat, but an oxidizing agent. And so it's pulling in the oxidizing agent here so you have a nice mixture of fuel when it gets up to the flame. And then we have things like when you're putting on eau de toilette, or how do you pronounce that? I don't speak French. Probably eau de toilette or something, I don't know. When you put on your toilet water, you have a little bowl that you squeeze, and it goes psh and out comes this nice smelling fragrance. How does the fragrance get in there? You push air over an open tube. The air going over the open tube has lower pressure. The atmospheric pressure in your vial then pushes the fluid up into the train of air and it comes out with the air. And if we've taken chemistry lab, you've used this. You use the old Venturi to get a lower pressure to suck stuff through your filter paper or something like that. And it's working on the same process. You have water going down through a spigot, a hole in the side, because the fluid, water is a fluid, is moving quickly. It has lower pressure and pulls air into it. And of course, if you plug this, then the fluid stops flowing, and then it'll come out here, which is what I always worried about. I guess I'm going to have to stop with this and not get to my firefighter problems. Airplane wings operate on this principle. An airplane wing is designed, first of all, it has a blunt front edge. It's blunt so that no matter what angle the airplane is coming, it will split the air smoothly. 
if it was sharp on the front edge and you tip it like this, it's going to cut the air differently. It's going to grab, right? That would be bad. So airplane wings are blunt on the front, sharp on the end. Sharp on the end so it brings the air back together as smoothly as it can. <laughs> blunt on the front so it separates as smoothly as it can. You have a longer distance for the air to travel over the top of the wing. To a good approximation, you can say the air is sitting like this, the air molecules. The wing comes and make the air molecules basically go like that. The top one covers a much bigger distance on the surface of the wing because of the curvature. Because it travels a longer distance in the same amount of time, the relative speed of the air to the wing is faster on top than on bottom. If the speed is faster on top, what does that tell you about pressure? It's going to be higher speed means lower pressure. So the pressure on top is lower than the pressure on bottom. So the force is pressure one times the cross-sectional area. It's not the surface area, it's the cross-sectional area. And the force on the bottom is pressure, actually, that was a T, pressure bottom times the same cross-sectional area. Because you have a bigger pressure on the bottom, you have a bigger upward force than you have a downward force creating what we call lift, and that's what keeps your airplane in the air. As the airplane slows down, the difference in pressure between the top and the bottom gets smaller, which means you have lower lift. So if the airplane slows down too much, you'll reach the point where the lift is less than the weight of the airplane. We call that a wing stall. And what happens when you get a wing stall? It just falls out of the air. It's no longer flying, it's falling. Sailboats do the same thing. Now, I have to end with this because it's probably my coolest demonstration I do. Ping pong ball, blow dryer. Ping pong ball in blow dryer. Probably not so cool, huh? But it gets cooler. How did that work? You did notice that it was out here not having the wind just blowing up on it anymore. How is it able to hold it out here, not above it? <laughs> because the air around it is in there. It, as, as it gets off to the side, the air underneath is, of course, going one speed, the air on top another. It will start falling down, but as it falls down, it gets down to closer to still air down here with most of the air going over the top. But the air going over the top has a higher speed, hence the lower pressure. Hence the air on the bottom is pushing up harder than the air on top is pushing down, and it holds it up there. Which I think is totally, totally cool. Have a great day. Remember, homework due tonight, labs due tomorrow, test next Tuesday, which means the scrapbooks are due next week. Should be doing about two scrapbooks. And it's what? The link is not. I just remembered as I was saying it. <laughs>